this is actually my, is it working? This is actually my 10th year working and conducting research on the Berkeley pit. And I always say whenever I need an ego boost, I just pull a talk together on the Berkeley pit because it always gets butts in the seats and that always makes me feel good because it's like people are coming to see me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I will try and do it justice today here. Um, I do appreciate the chance, the opportunity to talk here because I wanted to sort of gather my thoughts because Chris and I, Chris Gammons and I have actually been collaborating for a couple of years now on this story and it's a really good story. Um, and mostly I'm going to talk today about um, some of the monitoring activities that we've been doing for the last 31 years at the Bureau. I've been here for a third of that. Um, but and then I'm going to kind of segue into recent changes in the limnology and geochemistry of the pit. They've been pretty significant. I think it's a good story. And I want to kind of wrap this up eventually here pretty soon into a publication. So I do appreciate any of your guys' inputs and feedback and, and all that stuff. So I'm just going to get going here. Um, if my voice drops, I the only time I'm not loud and obnoxious is when I actually have people's attention. And so just scream at me, tell me to speak up, and uh, I will uh, do so. So, all right, here we go. Once I figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I'm pushing the arrow. How about them apples? All right. <laughs> here we go. Maybe not. Is there something special here that I have to do because? Oh, there we are. All right. So we're here basically because of 100 years of mining. Um, we're in the situation we're in because of 100 years of mining. Uh, when they first started mining for copper, it was late 1870s, early 1880s, they went into underground and, and did stope mining. And uh, they did that for a century. And they created over 10,000 miles of underground mine workings underneath the Butte Hill. This is a cross section of the Butte Hill right here. Um, this is the M right here. This is where you're sitting right there. This is the outline of the Berkeley Pit right there. All of these red vertical looking things are our mine shafts. And then these are the horizontal workings. And there are over 10,000 miles of underground mine workings. <laughs> They started mining out the Berkeley pit in 1955. And in order to mine out the, this whole area, they installed these huge dewatering systems in the underground. This was at the 2800 level of the high R, and this is at the 3900 level of the Kelly. And that pretty much designates the level below of ground surface that, they, that those systems are. So they're pretty deep. As you can see, this is the Berkeley pit bottom right here. And they went very far below the Berkeley pit bottom. So they mined out the Berkeley pit from 1955 to 1982, and then they shut off. The company declared bankruptcy. It was the Anaconda Mining Company. They declared bankruptcy, shut off the pumps. And these workings started filling up with groundwater. Um, and it's been doing that for the last 31 years. And so that's where we're at today. It was the Berkeley pit was a porphyry copper mining system. They switched to from underground to open pit because the grade of copper, uh, they pretty much mined out all of the really copper rich veins by the 1950s. And so they switched to this open pit copper system because it's a much more efficient way of getting to the ore. And this picture here shows, um, it's a picture from 1957 and it shows uh, pretty much the beginning of them working back the mountain that was the Butte Hill at that time. This is that hill, and I really like this figure a lot because it not only shows the bathymetry of the Berkeley Pit, but it has these white contour intervals, and those are 20-foot contour intervals, and it pretty much shows how much material they removed to dig out the Berkeley Pit. And it's been estimated, I didn't do it, but it has been estimated by the Anaconda Company and by others. It's been about 1.3 billion tons of material that have been removed from that area. And so when they shut the pumps off in 1982, this is what it, this is what the pit looked like. It was pretty deep. It was over a thousand feet deep. They created what is known as the critical water level. 
That's 5,410 feet above sea level. And that is the area that they're going to let the, the water fill up to before they start treating the system. The treatment system is lime technology. They run lime over. Um, they run, they pump Berkeley pit water, they run lime over it, they neutralize the, the, the water, and then it, it's clean. So that is the point that it's going to be allowed to fill up to. That was the water level as of October of 2013, and that's sort of what that looks like now. So it's filled up quite a bit. It's been uh, over 1,000 feet in the Berkeley pit. It's been about 1,050 feet. And even if the Berkeley pit was allowed to fill up to five, this, the critical water level, which it won't, and I will explain why it's not going to actually ever hit the critical water level, but at its minimum point, there's over 100 feet of clearance from the critical water level to the lowest point on the Butte Rim. And that's actually not here. It's farther to the south, but I couldn't do this without giving you that. But this, this, the, the spillover rate is there's 100 feet to go at its critical water level. And so this is the, the East Camp system right here, this outline right here. This is Butte. This is the Berkeley Pit. This is the Yankee Duke Tailings Dam. This is all of Uptown Butte. All of the groundwater in Uptown Butte expresses itself into the Berkeley Pit. And so you have all these underground mine systems right here. These are only the mine workings that are currently above the current water level of the Berkeley Pit. So these are only the levels that are actually infiltrating the Berkeley Pit right now. And these red dots are our monitoring network right, right here. And so when you talk about monitoring the Berkeley Pit, you're actually monitoring this entire area right, right here. You're monitoring all the groundwater here. You're monitoring the Berkeley Pit as, it's, as the groundwater is expressing itself as surface water. And you can see this is a picture in 1972. And over the years, it has filled up quite a bit. This picture is actually from pitwatch.org. It's a lot of bureau pictures in there, but they, they assembled this. And for the high school students in this room, pitwatch.org is probably the greatest um, uh, resource for you if you're ever wanting to learn about the Berkeley Pit. It, um, it was just revamped here um, about three months ago, and it went online, and it really is a great resource and I encourage you to look at it. And so this is another cross section through through Butte. You're looking sort of north northeast. Here's the M right here. Here's Charlie the ore digger. This is the East Camp mining system right here. This is the outline of the Berkeley Pit. There's quite a bit of vertical exaggeration on this this cross section. But these are the underground mine workings right here. And then these are five horizontal workings right here. And so they shut off the pumps in 1982 and it took about a year for the water to fill up to the bottom of the Berkeley pit. And you started to see water in the bottom of the Berkeley pit a year after they shut off the pumps. 66% of the underground mine workings were below the bottom of the Berkeley pit. Those filled up within a year. About 26% were between the bottom of the Berkeley pit water and the, where the current water level is right now in the pit. And it has taken 31 years for that 26% to fill up. And there are 8% that remain to be flooded. And so they set this critical water level at 5410. That's in the CD, the consent decree. But what does that mean? It's kind of a hard number. Nobody really understands it. So I'm trying to conceptualize it right here. 5,410 feet is the lowest point in the entire Butte Basin. It is the bottom of the Silver Bow Creek Channel as it exits the valley going out towards Rocker. Um, if you were to stand at the lowest point of the pit rim, you would be standing 100 feet above the critical water level. The lowest elevation of the pit rim is 5,510 feet. If you were standing at the courthouse, if you got in trouble, you were standing at the courthouse, you were standing at about 5,761 feet, well above the critical water level. 
If you were down at the Chamber of Commerce at the Visitors, Visitor Center, you were standing well above where the critical water level is. If you were down at the Civic Center, listening to a great concert, you're standing well above where the critical water level is. And East Middle School is well above the critical water level. And so I mentioned that the pit will never get to the critical water level, and that's because they established nine points of compliance wells and sites around the perimeter of the Berkeley pit. And those point of compliance sites, water levels, once they get to the 5410 mark, they're going to have to start pumping and treating for in perpetuity forever. And so where are those point of compliance sites? Well, they're pretty much located around the entire perimeter of the Berkeley pit, as you see here. Um, and if you think of the cone of depression, you think of the system as a bathtub, really. And the Berkeley pit is the sink. It's the lowest point in the bathtub all these other points around the Berkeley pit are higher. So once these get to the point of compliance, 5410, the critical water level, they're going to start pumping and treating. And the Berkeley pit will always remain well below the 5410 marker. So how far below? How do those point of compliance points match up to um, where the Berkeley pit water level is? So this is a hydrograph. It's called a hydrograph. You have water level elevation on this side you have date on this side. We've been monitoring the Berkeley pit since it's been filling up. Um, this is the critical water level right here. And we are still well below that point, that critical water level right there. We're still about a little under 100 feet below that, that point. And so these are two point of compliance wells right here. This is the Anselmo mine shaft. It's located furthest away from the Berkeley. It's the point of compliance site that lo that's located furthest away from the Berkeley pit. This is the Kelly mine shaft right here, and it's closest to the Berkeley pit. It's right next to the rim. So how does the Berkeley pit stack up with those hydrographs? And so it's been filling up. All these sites have been filling up. And they're filling up right now at about a half a foot a month, six feet a year. So, and so now I'm going to plot the Berkeley pit on this graph to show you where its water levels are. It's well below both of those point of compliance wells. And on average, um, it's about 20 feet, 25 feet below the, the elevation of the Anselmo water level. And so when, so when if everything stays the same, when the Anselmo hits, it's going to be the first point of compliance to hit the critical water level. It's going to hit, predicting at about July 2023, 10, um, almost 10 years from now. The Berkeley pit's going to be about 25 feet below that if everything stays the same. And so I mentioned that the, Bur the Bureau has been monitoring the Berkeley pit for the last 31 years. Um, when the water level was really down there, um, there was no way to really get to it, so they went in by helicopter. But now MR, the, op the mine operator, they built this really nice platform out there, and we've been using the boat for since I've been here for the last 10 years. But when did we start using the boat, Ken? Long time. About 1998. And so this is the USS Berkeley right there. I am Captain Nick Tucci of the USS Berkeley. These are, these are my mates right there. Um, so it's supposed to be over a thousand feet deep. It's supposed to be about 1,050 feet deep right now, but it's we tag bottom at about 800 feet, and that's because sloughing and other issues filling up the bottom. Right now, it's at about 42 and a half billion gallons of water. Um, there's no outlet. It's Terminal Lake. It has very poor water quality. It has about 12,000 milligrams per liter of dissolved solids, very low pH, and it exceeds about every water quality, inorganic water quality standard that exists. And so I mentioned that it was a terminal lake, but there are a lot of inputs to the lake system. It has groundwater, mostly through those underground mine workings. Groundwater is infiltrating and seeping into the Berkeley pit at about 3 million gallons per day. 
the in 2003 the prps of the potentially responsible parties uh built a the horseshoe bend treatment plant and that captures and treats that's eventually going to treat the berkeley pit system but right now it captures and treats what's called the horseshoe bend treatment plant and it um, releases the sludge in, from that treatment plant. It's a lime treatment plant. It's a high density lime treatment plant. And it discharges the sludge into the Berkeley pit. And that is about 250,000 gallons per day. Now, from this is kind of an important for my topic, so I'm going to talk about it here and there. But the Horseshoe Bend treatment plant, the Horseshoe Bend drainage is a seep at the base of the Yankee Doodle Tailings Dam. It's the old Silver Bow Creek. Uh, drainage system and it has been allowed periodically from time to time to discharge into the horseshoe or into the Berkeley pit and it's been it did that between 2000 and 2003 was the last time and it was about two to three million gallons per day that's important because horseshoe bend water is about as half as dense as Berkeley pit water and so as it was allowed to discharge into the Berkeley pit, it kind of pooled on top of the Berkeley pit and created this density stratification layer known as a chemopline, and I will talk about that further. Um, and then there's precipitation, which is about 12 inches per year, and there's also some stormwater runoff controls, stormwater diversions into the Berkeley pit. So those are the only inputs right now to the Berkeley pit. And the only out output right now is evaporation, which greatly overwhelms precipitation, and that's kind of why I didn't give a number for precipitation there. So here's another hydrograph. This shows pit, pit water level over time going back to 1983. And it was about 50, 4260. And now we're well over 5260. And so it's gone up over a thousand feet. Um, this is water level. And this is water volume volume of the Berkeley pit. Right now we're at about 42 and a half billion gallons. If it hits the critical water level, it's about 57 billion gallons. Um, this area outlined in blue, these two areas right here outlined in blue, were all the times that Horseshoe Bend water was allowed to, was diverted into the Berkeley pit and allowed to pool on top of that Berkeley pit. So for the majority of the time, you see throughout, uh, through flooding, the Berkeley pit has actually been this stratified system with this chemocline and it's never actually turned over. This was the Berkeley pit landslide right here. Um, and all these things you could see sort of changed the rate of rise here when they were allowing the, the Horseshoe Bend plant, Horseshoe Bend water to pool on top of the Berkeley pit, the rate of rise was a lot higher. And now it's sort of stabilized over since 2003, since the last time they since they've shut off that horseshoe bend influent, it's been rising at that half a foot a month level. I'm going to talk about one more thing, and that's this bar right here. That was the years of copper cement cementation. So the mine operator, um, MR, has actually been mining the Berkeley pit for copper, and they've been they do that using system called copper cementation. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but those were the years that they did that. And that process is relatively new if you consider the entire history of flooding, but it's had some pretty significant impacts on the water, on limnology and the chemistry of the water. And so that's going to be the remainder of the talk after this. This is from our latest publication from the Bureau. It's, it's, it's called a, a potential metric surface map. And it shows groundwater potential. And so these are areas where groundwater is higher and groundwater flows in that direction. So all the groundwater, most of the groundwater in the Butte Hill between, say, Excel and the Berkeley Pit, um, all that water flows into the Berkeley Pit. And we monitor on a monthly basis and the water levels in these and all these wells and we ensure that that cone of depression is maintained. And so here's the site right here and I'm going to go over um, a few important things for the remainder of my talk. That area right there is the active mine site. So this is the Berkeley pit. Everybody's pretty in this room is pretty 
familiar with that, I'm sure. This is the active mine right here. This is the Continental Pit. They're actively mining that area out. To the north, this is their tailings, tailings pond. So when MR processes their ore, they run it through this concentrator right here. It concentrates the ore, and then it produces tailings. And those tailings are pumped via slurry up to the tailings pond, and they're held back by this dam right here. That's one of the largest dams, earthen dams in the United States. And at the base of that dam is the Horseshoe Bend Seep, right there. And it flows at about three to three and a half million gallons per day. And from time to time, periodically, it was allowed to pool into the Berkeley Pit. And it created this density. This is a density profile for Berkeley Pit water. So you have depth here, and you have density, water density here. And you can see that there's this layer right there. And for most of the history of flooding, there has been that density stratification layer. What that does is you have a chemically, you have the water doesn't turn over. So you have two different, really two different bodies of water here. You have one right here and one right here. In 2003, they built the Horseshoe Bend treatment plant. And so all that water is now captured, treated, and then that's used as makeup water for the, uh, for the mine. And then there's the copper cementation plant. The copper cementation plant is right here. And they operated about, well, it operated most recently between 2003 and 2012. They shut it down in 2012, but for 10 years, it operated at about 11,000 gallons per minute. And they were basically, this was the method they were using to recover copper out of the water, to mine the copper out of the water. And they would pump deep Berkeley pit water at a depth of greater than 700 feet, run it over scrap iron, and then return it to the surface water. And that action um, had a lot to do is the main contributing factor for the water quality changes that I'm about to talk about. But first, uh, there's this conceptual model right here. And there's, it's a complex system, right? It, uh, there's all these surface water inputs. There's a lot of um, wall rock water interactions here. You have 3.5 million gallons a day of mine, basically underground mine water seeping into the Berkeley pit. You have a chemocline that was established from the Horseshoe Bend discharging. You have a lot of secondary precipitates happening in the oxic zone where oxygen is happening. Um, and you, this formation of these secondary precipitates is actually what gives the Berkeley Pit its color. And so you had this whole system, but it never turned over completely. So you, you had really these two, you had a chemically light water sitting on top of a chemically heavy water. And I like to use the example of black and tan ale, which everybody is familiar with. But then they started in 2003, they started running, started the copper cementation plant. And that had a dramatic effect on this entire system. This figure is, by the way, from Chris Gammons and Ted Duane. They, they, this is not my figure. And so now I'm going to talk about the copper recovery process. It's an age-old technology known. It was used uh, as far back as the 15th century in the Rio Tinto district of Spain. But it wasn't known in America, really, until a guy by the name of Fred Miller um, in 1888. He noticed back then they were dewatering all of the mines and just putting it right into Silver Bow Creek. And all that water, that high acid water, was just flowing right down Silverbow Creek. Well, Fred had uh, some property located right next to Silverbow Creek, and he had all these tin cans um, there was in, in Silverbow Creek, and he noticed that copper was plating out on these tin cans. So he got the idea to dig some holes and throw a bunch of tin into it, a bunch of iron into it, and plate out some copper. And he actually made a little bit of money off of that. He, was, he would he would get he would get that copper precipitate, sell it, and sell it to the smelters. And for two years, he was he worked very hard to keep that that technology a secret. Nobody else knew about it. Um, he ran into a lot of problems, and he started actually having to start threatening people, um, saying that it was proprietary data or proprietary technology, but it really wasn't. And then, really, it was William Ledford that revolutionized this entire process in Butte, 
in 1890. Um, he secured a lease from the Anaconda Mining Company and uh, made, within two years time, made $100,000 in 1890. And so that's, that's a lot of money in 1890. But two years later, the Anaconda Mining Company saw how much money he was making, pulled his lease and precipitation plants got erected all over, all over the Butte Hill. And it's a pretty simple technology. It's an ion exchange process. You're basically running um, water that has a lot of copper dissolved in, it, in the water over scrap iron. And it, the iron is replaced with elemental copper, and you're left with very high concentrations of dissolved iron in solution and then elemental copper. And there's a good example of this. If you ever walk through the Lexington mine shaft, there's, there's, it's a mine at it, and there's mine water running through the at it. And there's these old steel rails for the rail, the rail that are that are laid down as track, and there's copper plated out over that water. And so, the mine was doing that from 2003 to 2012. They have since shut it down. It's no longer operating. But this is that system, right here. Um, they're basically pumping at 11,000 gallons per minute water from Deep Berkeley Pit Lake water. It runs about 120 parts per million copper. They run it over the scrap iron right here. The copper gets replaced, or iron gets replaced with copper, and it's returning water at about 20 parts per million copper and very high concentrations in iron. So it's returning a lot of dissolved iron back into the pit. And before they started this process, there was over 40 million pounds of copper dissolved in Berkeley Pit. And so that's a heck of a source, and they were able to make some money off of exploiting that source. And it's had tremendous impacts on the water quality and it, for the better. And now I'm going to start going into those impacts. So this is the chemo. I talked about the chemocline, but this is a depth profile showing the uh, depth of that chemocline over time. And prior to the cementation plant, the chemocline was roughly around 50, always, it varied, but it was always above 70 feet below water surface until they started pumping that water at 11,000 gallons per minute. And then they started drawing it down. And this was, this was always an interesting thing to see. You could always, you could always see it. It was an immediate change in, in your parameters. Um, it was immediate change in pH. It was an immediate change in SC because it's two different water chemistries. You had, on above the, the chemocline, you had um, 60 parts per million copper, and there was an iron three always dominated this, uh, everything above the, above the chemocline. Below the chemocline, it was an iron two dominated system, and you had a lot more copper. You had twice the amount of copper. But in the fall of 2009, the actions of that pumping that deep water, uh, the chemocline went extinct. So there was no more chemocline. And so after the fall of 2009, we show up in the spring of 2010, and there's, you no longer see those differences. The entire, all 800 feet of the, water, of the water column is pretty much the same in water quality. And if you guys have ever been to the pit, you would have seen, prior to 2012, you would have seen this waterfall going. And that was the return water from that copper cementation plant. That was that, was that high iron, low copper water coming back from the cementation plant. And so now, you basically have no chemocline. You have seasonal top to bottom turnover, so the, the lake is always mixing. And that's why you have these homogeneous conditions in the in in the in the lake. Now I show this picture for two reasons. This is a temperature profile right here for 10 years of of the of of data that we have. On the on the y-axis here you have temperature. On the x-axis here you have temperature. On the y-axis here you have depth. And it's starting from zero at the surface. So this is surface, 100 feet below surface. And so below the chemocline, when the chemocline existed, you had this very warm water. Um, 
below the chemocline. As, as they were extracting that water below the chemocline and returning it to the surface, it was enough so that when there was a chemocline and they were doing that cementation, the pit never froze. It went through nine years of not freezing. And I made a hypothesis that, well, as long as there's a chemocline and they're operating this system, it's never going to freeze again. Well, in the fall of 2009, they, uh, the chemocline went extinct. The lake turned over. Now you had cold water at the bottom of the lake. At the bottom of the lake, so they're circulating cold water back onto the onto the surface, and now the pit froze for the first time in in nine years. And I made this hypothesis. I told everybody I knew about it because I was excited about it. You know, I was new to the bureau at the time, and everybody's like, "You're full of crap." You know, I mean, it's climate, all this stuff. And so, when this pit froze, like everybody that I knew and I talked to about this, every scientist and every engineer, every miner that I knew, sent me this picture. I don't think there's anything that scientists love more than proving other scientists wrong. But then I had to defend. So this is me defending myself right there. So, but it has had very real, the copper cementation plant has had very real impacts on water chemistry. These are copper depth profiles. These are dissolved copper concentrations. So you have copper on the x-axis. You have depth on the y-axis. And in 2002, right just prior to them starting the cementation plant up, copper was sitting at about 200,000 parts per billion. And over time, it gradually uh, got reduced to about 50,000 parts per billion. And right now, and for the last two years, it's been pretty much staying right there. And this is not depletion of the source. This is not because they removed all the source of copper in the wall rock. This is, they have established a new geochemical constraint on the solubility of copper. And it has established a new equilibrium right around 50,000 parts per billion of dissolved copper. Iron was probably the most interesting thing to look at in the pit. Um, you would think that the cementation plant, though, is returning high iron water back to the surface water. So you would first guess you would expect iron concentrations are just going to go through the roof. You know, they're going to increase. But it's had exactly the opposite reaction. Um, iron concentrations went, dissolved iron concentrations went from about 1,000 parts per million to around 200 parts per million. And so that was kind of a shocker to see that. And so we're, we, when we started seeing all this stuff, I, we had the idea that to put in sediment traps you know, because we're thinking that iron must be precipitating out of solution. That's the only thing that could be happening to it, that iron, these iron precipitates are forming. And so we put in a bunch of these, they're called Imhoff cones, to collect the sediment. And uh, we, we installed them for about four months. And the bottom sample actually filled up with these secondary precipitates and overfilled it. And so it was a pretty interesting it was one of the first attempts at ever trying to um, figure out how much secondary precipitates are forming and settling out of the system. And so if you do the mass balance, this reduction results in over 170 million pounds of iron that have precipitated out of solution in nine years. So what's going on with iron? Iron is probably the most important analyte in the Berkeley pit. It's what gives its Berkeley pit its beautiful luster. And uh, when you look at the speciation of iron to try and figure out what's going on, this graph shows iron 2 and iron 3 over time in both shallow and, and at depth. And iron, all species of iron and all, at all depths have decreased over time. And so that was, that was somewhat fascinating to me that you could, you know, you could add a lot of iron to the, to the Berkeley pit and just decrease the amount of dissolved iron in the Berkeley pit. So what's going on? And at first I wasn't going to put well-balanced chemical equilibria equations into my talk, but I figured, well, everybody's doing it these days, so that's the trend. And so 
But so you have a system here where you at the surface you have this dissolved iron being released into the into the surface water. And it's being oxidized to iron three, which is then transforming and precipitating out as the iron iron oxides and ox, iron sulfate hydroxides. And shortmanite is one of those one of those minerals that are known to precipitate out in the Berkeley pit. And this is the equilibrium reaction between uh, ferrous iron and shortmanite. Basically, you have eight moles of iron reacting with ten moles of water, sulfate, two moles of oxygen to produce shortmanite and 14 moles of acid. And that shortmanite forms, falls through the water column, and settles out. And so what's happening here? Well, you just increased this component of that equation, and you have actually driven this, the equilibrium of this reaction to the right. So even though you're, at, you're adding here, you're actually producing more, more solids. And so there's more stuff precipitating out in the water. And it's had indirect impacts on other things, too. Other contaminants like arsenic and other nutrients like phosphate. Um, we've seen over an order of magnitude decrease in arsenic. Arsenic went from about 1,000 parts per billion to just under 100 parts per billion. That's an order of magnitude decrease. And that's, so what's happening there? Well, it's at a pH of 2.5, when these iron oxides precipitate, you would expect those precipitates to be negatively charged, and, or positively charged. And you would expect anions to absorb onto them. Anions are negatively charged particles. And when, these, when stuff like shortmanite precipitates it out and it settles out, there's a scavenging effect. And things like arsenate, phosphate, are precipitating, co-precipitating out onto these particles, and then they settle, removing, effectively removing them from the water column. But we have not yet seen a drop in pH. And um, that's because the pH is a very well buffered system in, in the Berkeley pit. And it's either buffered by two reactions. And that would be the conversion from swartmanite to jarosite. Um, this, this reaction is known to occur, and it would buffer your acid, which is right there. And if you model this water, you do a quick geochemical model, the water is in equilibrium with shortmanite, and it is slightly supersaturated with the, the mineral jarosite. So it does have the potential to, to transition from shortmanite into jarosite. But um, Twidwell actually showed in 2006 that this reaction does occur. So this is happening, and it could very well be buffering the, the pH of the system. The pH could also be being buffered by aqueous sulfate. There's more sulfate in, dissolved in the water than any other constituent. It has about 8,000 milligrams per liter of sulfate. And at about a pH of 2.5, you would expect 5 to 10% to uh, of the sulfate to be protonated. This is a very fast reaction. It happens very fast. And the equilibrium reaction between uh, this, this reaction could be also buffering your pH. So it's one, of the, it's one or both of those that's buffering the pH. But when you're looking at a system like the, the Berkeley pit, the pH is a very poor indicator of the total acidity of the system. And that's because acidity is actually a sum of all of your po positively charged analytes in solution. And so it's not only a, a sum of your, your H+, plus, but it's a sum of all of your divalent cations and your trivalent cations. And there's a lot of those in the Berkeley pit. And so let's take the precipitation of swartmanite as an example. So again, you've got eight moles of ferrous iron reacting with oxygen, sulfate, and water and you're producing Schwartmanite, it's a solid, but then you're producing 14 moles of acid right there. And you're saying, well, that's producing acid. That's not consuming acid. And it is producing 14 units of acid, but ferrous iron is also an acid. So you're consuming 16 units of, of total acidity. And you're with every mole of Schwartmanite that gets precipitated out in the Berkeley pit, 
you are decreasing your total acidity by 12.5%. Same idea with Jerosite, only you're consuming six moles of acid for every three moles, for every three moles of acid produced. And so that is a reduction of about 50%. And so is this happening? Are these precipitates forming in the water? Well, they are. You go to the sides of the Berkeley pit and you see this, this is ochre, this is an iron hydroxide, just secondary precipitate that's on the, you see it on the shores of the Berkeley pit all the time. Um, again, it's what gives the Berkeley pit its color, but Twidwell basically took a bunch of cores from the Berkeley pit and analyzed them to see what was in them. And the majority of them was jerosite. And so jerosite is actively precipitating out in the Berkeley pit. And when you look at this stuff under SEM photomicrograph, you see that this stuff right here is gypsum. This amorphous looking material right here, that's Schwartmanite. And this platy looking mineral right here is actually jerosite. And these are the three most common minerals that you would find, secondary minerals that you find in the Berkeley pit. So this is happening. So in other words, acidity is being transferred from the aqueous phase to the solid phase. And then the solid phase is dropping out of the system and it's permanently removing the acidity from the system. I compared this, uh, some data that we collected in 2012, some acidity data from 2012 to Huang's data that he did um, during his bench scale tests in 1992. And he actually did full titrations and showed that data. The Bureau only does two endpoints. We do an endpoint at pH of 4.5 and a pH of 8.3. The way you do, you measure acidity is you take the Berkeley pit water, it's an acid solution, and you add sodium hydroxide to it in increments and you measure the pH over time and you get a measurement of acid. And these are, and when you compare Huang's historic data to the 2012 data, there was a 26 to 30 per percent decrease in acidity through that time. But those are only two, those are only two data points, right? So. If you actually model this and calculate the, the acidity, you could do that if you have water quality reports, which we do. It pretty much correlates pretty nicely with this data right here. There's about a 20, 25 to 30% decrease in total acidity over time. And so why is that important? Well, it takes about two moles of lime to, to treat one mole of acid. So treatment costs. So in July, the Ber treatment of the Berkeley pit begins in July of 2023. And the effect and the chosen remedy is actually Lyme treatment. And the, well, essentially what we've done is the RI uh, states that their treatment costs for lime would be, or the amount of lime that it would take to treat one ton of Berkeley pit water, it'd take about nine pounds of, of lime to treat one ton of Berkeley pit water. If you're talking a 30% removal of acid, you're looking at now six pounds of lime to treat one ton of Berkeley pit water. And so significant cost savings. And so in summary, there took about six years between 2003 and 2009 for uh, the copper recovery system to eliminate the vertical stratification of the Berkeley pit. Since that time, there's been seasonal top to bottom turnover events and it's pretty much homogenized the entire water column. Dissolved, concert, dissolved copper and iron concentrations have decreased significantly dissolved arsenic, which is a contaminant, and phosphate concentrations have decreased by over an order of magnitude. And the total acidity has decreased by about 25 to 30%. So I like these two pictures because that water right there, this picture was taken in March of 1998. That water right there is green. I've been working in the Berkeley pit for 10 years. I've never seen green water at the surface of the Berkeley pit. And so this shows that there was turnover at that time. So the, 
chemistry of the Berkeley pit is always changing, you know, but I mean, we, we have this snapshot in time. We have really good data to suggest that this is happening and what the copper precipitation plant ha did. And, you know, I think it's a good story because rarely is the case, if ever is the case, can you say that actively mining something for something improves water quality. So, well, and that's all I got. I'd be glad to take any of your questions. Yes, Larry. You would redissolve those all those